All right. Um, let's look at what we did last time and build upon it. There's sort of four things I want to talk about, about forms. Yeah. We'll see how many of them we get through today. First thing that we'll talk about is making the forms accessible. And visually, people get information about what form fields mean by seeing the proximity between the label and the thing on the screen. So, for example, if I were to go to, let's say, Amazon. And I were to go to log in, let's say. Because you can see, you know that this is a label associated with this, and this is a label associated with this. When a screen reader is narrating the page, that can be lost. All right? Therefore, there's a tag it's pretty straightforward to employ that's a label tag that associates text with a input uh, input element. So let's do that first. This is one of the key things to do to make forms accessible. The other thing, uh, one of the other things to do, we have to have a little more um, stuff on our form that involves breaking them into set, breaking the form into sections and stuff like that. But we'll uh, we'll deal with that um, later on. But we'll at least start with this. So I open this up and put the word search for before that text box. Now, for someone that can see, that's enough because they can see the proximity of the phrase search for, uh, for next to the, um, the uh, text box. However, someone that can't see won't be able to necessarily tell based on the proximity, so you use a label tag. And the way the label tag works is like this. Label for, and then you give an ID. And I'm just, I'm going to make it QID just to be clear that I'm talking about the ID and not the name. So I would go ID equals QID. And what that means is the screen reader will associate this text with this form element because it's linked by the IDs. So for is the name of the attribute. You can sort of read that in your head for this ID. And this ID, in this case, is QID. So therefore, that links to screen readers this bit of text to this input item. All right? Um, so that's one of the things we can do for accessibility. Um, we can do other things uh, for styling. Just for convenience purpose, I'm going to put the CSS code in here. Oh, we'll wait till I have a few more fields. All right. Um, let's see. Now, when you do a Google advanced search, you see that there are other things other than your search term that you can supply. And we're going to take a look at one of them. So if I do a search for HTML, 
one of my options under here or under more somewhere here maybe search there we go is I can do uh, more advanced search to narrow things down so for example I could search for language so let's look for things that are in Greek all right that gave me search for things in Greek Now, if you look up here, we can reverse engineer, and this LR is the field on the query string that says, determines what language this is. So if I was going to add that to the form, I could do this. Because again, when I looked up on the query string, that's where the language went. LR and Greek apparently is lang EL. I'm going to copy that. Now, when I run this, save it. I run it, I can search for HTML, and I can say I want the language of Lang EL, do a search, and there is my search results in Greek, because again, I match what the server is expecting. Typically, if you're developing the whole thing, you're going to know what the server is expecting, so you don't have to do that reverse engineering like I did, where you look at the query string and figure out what things are. Now, what would what do you suppose French would be? FR. Probably Lang FR. And I can tell it's French because instead of hypertext markup, it's le hypertext markup. <laughs> so that tells me that my French search worked. Spanish, maybe ES or maybe SP. Let's try SP. Yeah. It's not SP, because that's giving me English results. Let's try ES. All right, so ES is correct. Now, that's the thing, right? Who knows, who has language codes memorized? All right, yeah, maybe some people do, but not everyone. Therefore, we wouldn't want a text box to enter in the language code, because I can type anything I want to in that text box, is a free form text box. So I can type anything, even if it isn't a valid language. And the good news is it doesn't blow up, but the bad news is it doesn't really give me my results. All right? So what I want to do is I want to limit the selection to a couple different options. All right? To, to a list of options. And, you know, we could find probably a few hundred language codes and create a drop down with those in. So one of the ways that you can limit the selection to a certain number of defined values is with a dropdown. So that's the next thing that we're going to cover. And you do that because keep in mind that very often the script is expecting certain, the data to be formatted a certain way. So in the case of language, you can't just freeform the word language in there. It has to follow the convention of the international coding for languages. So we have to follow that convention. And that's something that some people probably wouldn't know off the top of their head. So what we're going to do is we're going to go and put uh, in a dropdown that contains a few different values. 
So let's go and edit this. So instead of an input with a type of text, I'm going to do a drop down. Now a drop down doesn't use an input tag. Some of the input controls use input tags, some of the input controls use other things. And a drop down is one of those other things. All right? And a drop down actually uses a select tag. And I can give it an ID just like I would give a text box. And I can also give it a name. Notice that the name and ID are two things uh, and they're both needed. The ID is needed for the label. All right. The name is used because that's the name that it's called on the query string that gets sent to the user. So I have to call it LR here. All right. The ID has to match what I use in the label. This has to match what the server expects it to be. Now, in a lot of cases, I'll just go and make the name and the ID the same thing, just to make it easy. But they are two different distinct things, so I will keep them as different. So we define our select like that, and the select really is a list of options that you can choose from or rather the user can choose from. And the options have two pieces to them. All right? The options have a text description of what the option means, and it also has a value that the script needs. All right? If you remember Greek, all right, Greek, it wasn't something obvious, right? It was lang underscore el. If we wanted to do a search for Greek stuff, is it obvious that it's lang underscore el? Probably not. What would be obvious? Well, if we put the word Greek there in the drop down. So Greek. But the script behind the scenes needs that value that it understands. So there's two pieces of each option. There is the value of the option, and then there's the text that gets displayed. So in the case of this, I'm going to have option value equals lang underscore el and then between the start and the end option tag I'm going to put something that is recognizable by people, by humans. So between the start and end option tag is the human readable expression is what humans are going to understand. And between the, uh, the, or the value attribute is going to be what the script is going to see. All right? So it's important to differentiate between that. So we'll add a couple of these things on the list. We'll do three. If you do one, if you do a few of them, you can do as many of them as you need to. So this is a drop down. Again, three options. Between the start and an option tag, we have what is recognizable for people. The value attribute of the option is what the script is going to see as the value of that drop down. Excuse me. It's what's going to get passed on the query string. So if I save this and run it, I can pick that and do a search, CSS, and I get cascading style sheets in French. Or I can say Greek and get cascading style sheets in Greek. Yes? Not to go too far. Yes. 
example if we do a Greek if we do a Greek search the Greek alphabet has a lot of characters that the Roman alphabet doesn't have if we click on this notice it contains all those characters if we look at the source of this we'll notice that language EL direction LTR left to right and the character set is UTF dash 8 and so it's using the character set of UTF-8 but it specifies the language as EL so therefore it recognizes the characters that are not available in the Roman alphabet. Okay now a Drop-down is one way that we can limit the number of options. You can actually make a drop-down allow users to pick uh, more than one option. But that really wouldn't be make sense here because of the way that the advanced search works in Google. It only expects one language. So it wouldn't do us any good to do that. All right. We can also give a height to it so that we can see multiple uh, multiple options all at once if we wanted to. Typically though a drop down is going to look like this. Now, another alternative to a drop down where you limit most part, down, part with drop downs they're mutually exclusive. Uh, but another option where the where the things are mutually exclusive is radio buttons, our radio buttons. So I'm going to just copy this form and I'm going to make a copy of the form underneath. I'm going to do the same thing, except I'm going to do, use radio buttons to do it instead. So let me go into Notepad with this. I'll even put a header above this. Search with drop down. And I'll copy everything. Now keep in mind I'm only doing this for example purposes. All right, There would really be no need for you to have two forms to do a search on there. You wouldn't need to do it both ways. You'd pick which way made sense. Usually it's, it's a real estate issue. right? A drop down can show things more concisely. Because the drop down, if there's 200 elements, it only takes up the space for the one until you click on the drop down, then they all drop down. Whereas the radio buttons are always visible. All right? So if I had 200 countries, let's say, uh, I would have to have 200 radio buttons and that would likely take up uh, a lot of space. But, you know, that's part of your job as a designer is figure out which one fits worse, you know. Uh, or fits worse? Yeah. <laughs> fits worse and then don't do that one. Do the other one. Figure out which one fits better. All right? So, here I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to change it into radio buttons. Now, here's the thing about a radio button compared to the other things that we've seen. Radio buttons in a group all are going to have the same name. That's what makes them a radio button. And what do we know about radio buttons? When you click one, it unclicks the other. So you can't choose more than one from a group of radio buttons. What makes things a group of the radio buttons has nothing to do with the position of them or anything like that. It has to do with the name. So, um, type uh, radio name equals LR. Remember, that's the name that the server is expecting, is the name. 
and ID equals, now even though they have the same name, they're going to have different IDs. That's a rule. No matter what, no two things can have the same ID. Two things can have the same name in the case of radio buttons. Two things can have the same class, but two things cannot have the same ID. in the wrong order. I got almost no sleep last night. I took a long nap during the day and I was up all night. And that's not good. make an observation here that we can actually do this form with radio buttons or a drop down and the server if provided we do it correctly the server doesn't care search for English, uh, or let's search for French, that way we know that it worked. Uh, we can search for CSS and search. And notice that it works, and notice that on the query string it looks the same, whether I use a radio button or a drop down. In other words, the form doesn't care, I'm sorry, the server side script doesn't care what your form looks like. All right? As long as you supply things with the proper name, the form's going to work. If you remember, in my first iteration, I used a text box, which probably isn't a good idea, but at the very least, it, it worked, all right, to some degree. <coughs> Questions on this so far? Now, when you're designing a form, make sure you pick the thing that makes sense. All right? So, if there's only a few options, you don't want to use a text box. Right? You want to use a radio button or a drop down because that limits them to picking one of a list of valid options. All right? Your text boxes and radio buttons, you want to label such that um, it's intelligible to a person reading it. Like, for example, you know, um, if you wanted to do a search for a certain professor on campus, and there was a drop down for professors. Now, probably the database keeps track of professors by their faculty ID number, right? But it wouldn't make sense to display a list of faculty numbers or faculty ID numbers because no one knows what those are. I mean, I know mine, but I don't know anyone else's, right? 
And therefore, what makes sense would be to show the name. So when you design the form, you show it, you display it in a way that's going to be understandable to the people that are using the form. And the values of the stuff is the stuff that the script needs to do its job. Okay, questions about what we have so far. What other things exist on a form besides radio buttons, text boxes, radio buttons, text boxes, drop downs, and submit buttons? Check boxes. Check boxes. What's the difference between a check box and the things that we've seen so far? Yeah, check boxes are not mutually exclusive. So uh, now Google search doesn't work this way, but if there was another kind of search where you could search for classes about a particular topic and you could say I want accounting classes or CISS classes or phys ed classes you could check all the ones that you're interested in and then it would search uh, for all of those so that's when it's not mutually exclusive what are other things besides check boxes Well, that's the basic text box. The basic text box is a single line of text. Backgrounds. Pardon me? Like backgrounds, pictures, you could add in some. There is an upload control where you can browse for an image or a file to upload. That's true. Let's go to W3 Schools and see what we have for this. Well, under HTML4, there are essentially two kinds of text boxes. There are text boxes and password text boxes. HTML5 has expanded to being other kinds of text boxes as well. And that gives you a dilemma because not all browsers support all that and so on and so forth and therefore you might still have to write some JavaScript code. So we'll talk about HTML5 stuff. Notice again that I can't, under HTML4, I can't make the text box required. All right, If I click on it and there's nothing there, it just goes on its merry way. All right, let's look for HTML forms. All right, there's our form, we submit, and there's our result. All right, we've kind of done that before. The form element, we talked about that. Input type, type equals text. Input radio button, submit button. We've done all those. We've talked about the action. The target, generally speaking, avoid. That allows you to do it. The method specifies whether it's going to be visible on the query string or not. So notice that sends it, and you can see it on the query string. If we change this to post, notice we don't see it on the query string, and yet it knew that my name was Mickey Mouse. It's just a different way of passing the data. Obviously, if you're passing passwords to a script, you wouldn't want to display it up on the query string because then it could be intercepted. Talks about getting and post, the name attribute, field sets. That's one thing that you can do is field sets are also useful for accessibility, where you can group things together, uh, group form elements together and give them a name. That can be very useful if you have fields that look similar. All right? For example, field address maybe and we'll wonder well what address are they asking for 
all right? Uh, I'm going to tweak this example a little bit. Here's personal information with a field set. We could alter this a little bit. And you could have a second field set, field set for spouse information. And of course, Mickey's spouse is Minnie. And we only need one submit button, so I'll get rid of the second submit button. And then notice that it gives sort of a, uh, a value uh, that describes the group of fields, what they mean. Both of these are first name and last name, but by putting this around it, it makes it clear that that's the first name for you, and this makes it clear that it's the first name for the spouse. So you can use field sets as well, too. Notice they use break tags. Do not use break tags. All right. Uh, what we did is we did a more purest way of putting things on, on its own line by saying, look, a form is really a list of values that you're sending to the server. So what do lists belong in? They belong in UL tags. So I made an unordered list, and I put all the stuff in there. And that's the preferred way of doing it. All right, form elements. All right, the input element is the basic one. If uh, type equals text uh, is for a basic text box, select, we went over that. You can default something by saying option selected. All right, so notice that fiat is the default even though Volvo is the first item. The other thing you can do is you can arrange your drop down so that the most popular item is on top. All right. If there is no true default, all right, then it's best to put the top item something like please make your selection. All right. Uh, again, though, unfortunately, with prior versions of HTML, there's no way to make that required, and you'd have to write JavaScript validation to make sure they've picked something other than the, the dummy value that's at the beginning. The point is, you make a default if it makes sense to make a default. All right, You don't make a default just as a lazy way to get out of validating it. So, for example, if there was a drop-down for uh, on the uh, on Lorain County Community College's uh, enrollment forms, all right, or uh, admission forms. You know, are you in county, out of county, or out of state? Now we have students from all three of those categories, right? But I don't know exact numbers, but I would think it would be reasonable to make the default in county because. Yes, there are people that don't live in Lorain County. Yes, there are people from other states and other countries. But the default would be Lorain County. So you can make it a default uh, value um, if you think it's true in most of the cases. On the other hand, if you had, like, what topic are you interested in? What's, what's, the main, what's your main course of study? Or what are you planning on majoring in? and you had a drop down for that, probably, there probably isn't a default major, right? There's one that's more popular than the rest. I'm sure one of the majors has more students than other majors, but yet there's it's not so many people that are majoring in that that you can say, well, that's a default, all right? The danger of setting something as a default is that uh, people can ignore it and just select the default when they didn't intend to. The advantage of making a default is it, if it really is the default case, you save the person a little bit of time. 
There's some other things you do. For example, here is a way you can show a drop down that actually shows all four of them at once by simply saying a size of four. All right. Next thing is a text area. A text area is where you have a multi-line text field. So comments, special instructions, type your complaint here, something like that would be in a text area. And again, any of these, and they do this a lot in these examples, they give them default values. I don't know if you'd want to do that or not. But if you don't give it a default value, that's what it's going to look like. Now, notice it says 10 rows, 30 columns, which I would do via CSS. But even if it does give you that size, that doesn't mean that you're limited to that. I can type in as many lines as I want. So I've gone, I've gone way before beyond the 10 lines. That is the visible space. So 10 lines are visible, 30 columns are visible. If you needed to limit that, like for example, if you're writing to a database and the comments field only allowed 255 uh, characters, or if you're writing Twitter and the maximum number of characters is what, 140 or 280, I forget. Um, I think they increased it, didn't they? 300. 300? Something around yeah, I, don't, I don't like Twitter. It takes, it takes me 300 characters to make a cup of coffee, you know. Um, but anyhow, if you wanted to limit to that, you, that would be a job for JavaScript. And so I know it used to be that as you were typing, it showed you when you got over and made each subsequent character red or something like that, you know. Again, uh, you'd do something like that via JavaScript. So text area would be for comments or something out of the ordinary. A button. Until we learn JavaScript, there's no need for us to have buttons. All right? You could. Just like a fancier looking link? You could, but you could also style a link, uh, an, an anchor tag to look like it. All right? So we're going to, generally speaking, avoid button. And I don't think they show checkboxes, or did I pass them? Here, there it is. Here's a password. A password doesn't echo, so if someone's looking over your shoulder. You don't have it. Uh, the submit is the submit button. Sends it to the server. Reset. Don't use a reset because you're on the risk of accidentally clicking it. Your user does and wiping out everything that you've entered in. If I remember right, let me try. How do you search for classes? You go to my campus. There used to be like a really horrible design on the search for classes. Well, I guess we're not going to see it today, though. Let me try to explain it to you. It had a submit button. There, there was a whole big area where you could type in the criteria of what, what, you, what kind of courses you were searching for, like what department, what professors you wanted. I did find it funny that it allowed you to search for classes for a professor you wanted, but not classes for a professor that you didn't want. All right, but anyhow, another design flaw. You could enter what days of the week that you wanted to come. Like if, if you know your work schedules, you work Tuesday and Thursday, you can search for Monday and Wednesday classes. You can search, I'll put all this criteria in, and then there are two buttons, a search and a reset button. Guess what? 
the research button was bigger and the reset button was first. All right? So every time I did that, I would go and click that, have it clear out and say, oh, shoot. All right? And I thought it was just really poor design. It, if I really wanted to reset, I could re refresh the page, you know, and have, give the control. So I don't really see a good reason for having a reset button. It sets things back to their default, but I don't know. I avoid them. Radio button, we talked about those. Check boxes. All right, I have a bike, I have a car. Could be mutually, or it's not mutually exclusive. You can have both and submit that, and it says that you have a car and you have a bike. When it displays it where? Uh, on the, the query string? Well, you wouldn't use a query string for it. But if you did put it on the query string, yeah, it would show you the okay. password. That's what I was saying. But if you click the input, does it show like the full actual password after it's typed in, is what I mean? You mean so that you could t see that you typed in right? or? I'm just saying because if you go up there where it showed the password, it, 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 you couldn't see what you were typing in. Right. But once you push the input, it'll show the text, correct? Once you click submit, you mean? Yeah. It will show it on the query string. Okay. That's but I'm you wouldn't want that to happen. Right, right. You would avoid using that. And a lot of browsers have a little thing where you can click and you can peek at the, the password. Like, uh, to make sure that you've entered in right. Okay. Which is especially an issue like on mobile devices where, like, your fingers so might hit. Yeah. So it's easy to mess up. Button is just like I said before, don't use buttons. Now, there's a whole slew of HTML5 input types, all right, that will make your life easier, kind of, all right. Why do I say kind of? Well, there's good news and bad news here, because they're really multi-purpose text boxes, all right. So a date input type is a text box that only accepts dates. In HTML4, there was no such thing. There was just a text box, and you could put any text into any text box. If you want to make sure it was a date, you had to write your JavaScript validation to do it. All right? Now, in HTML5, for example, there's a date text box, which forces you to only type in a valid date. So I'm going to try to type in the 13th month. It changed it to 12. I'll try to type in the 88th month, change it to 8, all right? So you can't type in an invalid date. All right? Or if I click this, I can go up. And then I click Submit. Now here's the problem. Some browsers it doesn't work on. Let's look, let's see what version of Internet Explorer we have. Notice what happens here. This version of Internet Explorer I can type whatever I want to in it. Which is bad news, right? Because if you are concerned that someone might have one of these older browsers, you're still going to have to write the JavaScript validation for it. All right? Um, here's the sort of good news, though. Uh, the, the, it's like good news, bad news, and then some sort of good news. Is that the way HTML works, it practices what we described before as graceful degradation. In other words, this browser doesn't support HTML5 input types of date. But guess what? All right? It doesn't break it. It simply treats it like a plain old text box. It doesn't recognize input type of date and therefore the default for a input tag is type equals text. 
So any of these HTML5 things that the browser doesn't understand, and there's date, there's a date time that has a date and a time, an email address, a file name, month, number, and so on. Any of those that it doesn't understand, the older browsers are going to treat it just like a, uh, uh, a, a text box. Now, is that a big deal? Well, again, you know, uh, you don't want to leave older users with older browsers out to dry. So you do sort of have to accommodate them. Uh, let's see. This is kind of a cool one. You can pick your favorite color. And if you click this, you actually can get an HTML, a uh, little color picker. And you submit it, and it will do that. That's good for, like, customization or something like that if you want to allow someone to customize their color scheme. So when you're designing this, you would have the HTML5 elements and the JavaScript included? I, what, what I would do is I would look at the, I would look at the, the browser statistics for who supports it and who doesn't. I would probably grip my teeth and say, yeah, we probably still have to write JavaScript validation. And then I would write JavaScript validation if maybe I was that here. would be just for like certain areas too, like maybe like for like username, password, email, like really important elements, stuff like that. Uh, possibly, yeah. If there definitely was like nothing, no bad consequences, then maybe, or like for example, if it was connected to a database, you could do server-side validation, which you should do anyhow, because, you know. But, the, yeah, um, there's a lot of different strategies that you could employ for that. You could look and say what the percentage is, and at a certain point, you do have to say, well, look, we're not supporting this browser, because otherwise we'd have to write code that worked on a Netscape 1.0 browser or something like that, and that would, be, that would not be practical to do. Okay, the only thing I really haven't covered, and I know I kind of went over things a little quickly today, because uh, the form lab is due today, I think, and... So you have a fighting chance of getting it done today. If you are late, that's okay, because we're just wrapping this up now. The only thing that we didn't cover is styling, which I'll spend a few minutes styling uh, on uh, Tuesday next week. But you guys have all done CSS code now. Let me just say as sort of a hint, you can make a really nice looking form if you, let's go back to this guy. You can make a nice looking form if you get rid of those dots, all right? You make the labels a certain width, all right? You text align those to the right. You text align these guys to the left, and you get a nice little where the labels line up next to, line up very neatly next to that. So that's my hint of the day, all right? Uh, but other than that, you can do, you could give, we talked about uh, um, uh, field sets. You can style field sets to give them a light gray background and make them stand out. It's anything we talked about in CSS you can try. That's my one form hint about giving the labels a fixed width and making them text aligned to the right. Yes, to the right. Okay, we'll probably talk a little bit about styling on Tuesday, and then we'll get into our next topic, whatever that is. I will probably, I aim to post the remaining assignments this weekend. So knock on wood. All right? I'll see you in lab. I'll go open the door, I'll come back for the files, and then I will be back uh, in lab.